assurance. I pray and hope all of you have that. Blessed assurance because Jesus is yours and you belong to him. I pray that you have that assurance. Amen. So let's turn our Bibles this morning to the epistle of James chapter 1. This will be a text this morning, James chapter 1. Uh, Children's Church, I think Miss Cindy has that. So if uh, you would like to get out of Children's Church, just follow that uh, young lady coming down the aisle side aisle right here. Any children who would like to go down about eight and under, nine and under, something like that. So everybody else has turned the Bibles to James chapter 1. We have the text verses 9 through 12. James chapter 1, verses 9 through 12. We the text. And let's stand up in the honor of the reading of God's word this morning. James 1, 9 through 12. James 1, 9. Let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation, but the rich in his humiliation, because as a flower of the field, he will pass away. For no sooner has the sun risen with a burning heat than it withers the grass, its flower falls, and its beautiful appearance perishes. So the rich man also will fade away in his pursuits. Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Oh God, I pray that everyone can say in their heart this morning, right now, Lord, I love you. I love you. Lord, your word will indeed go into the deep divisions of our hearts and minds and souls this morning to discern if what we just said, I pray in our hearts and maybe by our tongues, is true. Do we love you above all things, above all else? Because, Lord, you do not tolerate a divided allegiance. We see that here in your word. We saw it last week. As we looked at verses 2 through 8, we, we saw a double-minded person is unstable in all of our ways. So, Lord, I pray you would use your word now. I know that you will because your word never returns void. But, Lord, I pray you would sanctify your people and help all of us to not only hear and understand, but to apply what we will learn today in our daily lives. Because, Lord... This message, this, this word that we have read is very practical, applies to all of us here, all of us. And we pray and know that you will do all these things and more because you are good yes. and your mercy endures forever and your grace, your grace is abundant and sufficient. So we thank you for what you're going to do. And Lord, I pray that you would help me to just communicate your word in truth, rightly divided, speak in passion and in love. And I pray all of these things in the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated this morning. I titled the message, Enduring the Temptation of Worldly Wealth. All of us have to endure this. All of us face this. What do we do about worldly wealth? By the way, if we look at world standards, all of us in this room are wealthy. Remember that. I read some, somewhere one time where half the world's population lives on the equivalent of $10, 10 American dollars a day. Imagine that. Half the world's population lives on the equivalent of $10 a day. So if half the world's population came into our homes, first thing they'd probably ask is, who all lives here? Well, me and, me and my spouse few kids. You mean you don't have 15, 20 family members living here? There's room. You mean just two or three people live here in this home? They would go into our closets and think that we were the clothing closet for the whole community. Right? Did y'all have to dig out some things to wear this morning? Like, oh, what should I choose? Oh, I forgot about this. It was buried back in there. I found it. They would think our closets were the clothing closets for the whole community. They would look at our refrigerators and then our cabinets and 
think that we were the food pantry for the whole community. How much food do you need? They would look into our freezers and say, this is unbelievable. Why, you could feed our whole entire village for three days on this. So remember, by world standards, we're wealthy. But I know we live in America, right? So in America, sometimes, especially in the last couple of years, we can sometimes feel like we're poor. Especially if you've uh, purchased any eggs. <laughs> I'm beginning to appreciate uh, Sheila's chickens more and more. <laughs> uh, yeah, Jason, I think we're about ready to break even uh, on the chickens, you know. Um, I, think, I think we're about ready to break even on that. And I better move on or I'm going to end up wearing some eggs. When I'm <laughs> but, price of eggs. And everything's going up, right? So sometimes when we come out of Walmart, we come out of Kroger, we feel kind of poor. Sometimes when we pay our electric bills or whatever, you know, everything's, and, and it frustrates us. But the truth of it is, by American culture, and I know we're in American culture, right? We're middle class. I mean, I think that's how most of us would not identify. We're in the middle. We're not rich, but we're not poor. We're right in the middle. So, Pastor, does this let us off the hook? Because what I see here is a lowly or poor brother and rich. So we're in the middle, so does that let up? No, because that means we have double the temptation. That means we're poor both ways. We're in the middle. We're middle class. Okay? So let's get started on how we can resist this temptation. And there's two things, and I want you to maybe jot this down if you're out. You've got your outline. Your Bible's open. Rejoice and resist. Okay? If you want to overcome the temptation of worldly wealth, you've got to rejoice and resist. Rejoice in where you are, what God has given you, and resist the temptation to want other things. Okay? So let's start out with the poor. Number one, the poor believer must rejoice, first point, in their exalted status, the Bible teaches. The poor believer must rejoice in their exalted status because the poor believer has an exalted status. If you look in James chapter 2, verse 5, look what the Bible says in James 2, 5. Listen, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who... Love him. Now we read that verse and say, well, now what about the rich? Can the rich be saved? Thank God they can. Okay? Or we'd all be in trouble. But the Bible says, has God not chosen the poor in this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he promised to those who love him? Well, we have to remember what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So the poor in spirit, I think is what James kind of is alluding to here, the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom. But this we know. This we know. It is hard for wealthy people to enter the kingdom of God because of the distraction, the distraction of wealth. That's why it's hard. Look what Jesus said in your outline, Matthew 6, 24. Jesus said, no one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon is material goods. It's not just money. It's material possessions. You cannot serve them both, Jesus said. And you remember the rich young ruler, right? In, in, in Matthew chapter 19, he came to Jesus and he said, Lord, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, hey, you know the commandments, don't you? Yeah. And I've kept them from my youth up. I've kept them. So what, what else do I need? And Jesus said, well, if you want to be perfect, go and sell all you have and give it to the poor and lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. What did a rich man do? He walked away very sorrowful, sad. Because Jesus said the final thing, Jesus said, remember that? And come follow me. The rich man walked away from Jesus, very sad, because he had what? Many possessions. That's a context. Look what Jesus said after that, afterwards in Matthew 19, 23. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Assuredly I say to you that it is hard. He didn't say it was impossible. He said, thankfully, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And then he said, in addition to this, he said, Behold, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And his disciples said, well, who can be saved? Because, hey, in the disciples' culture, in Jewish culture, if you were wealthy, you were blessed by God. 
So they, they saw the wealthy as the blessed of God. So the disciples are confused. Who can be saved? And thank God Jesus said, with man it is impossible, but with God all things are possible. But it's hard because of the distraction of wealth. It's hard. So hey, if we're Americans and we're all wealthy and we have a lot of possessions, and don't tell me that you don't because I know you do. <laughs> These things distract us, don't they? They distract us. And they're always seeking to divide our allegiances. You know, like we've got one foot in the world and one foot, you know, we want to go to God and we're kind of torn. Hey, we got to understand this. That for the poor and for us, we have to understand the spiritual riches God promises us. Look in your outline in Romans 8, 16 and 17. This is the truth. That the poor can rejoice in their exalted status. This is what the really the Bible's truly speaking about their exalted status. Not only do they have to worry about not to worry about distractions, but what's to come. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then we're heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with Him, that we also may be glorified together. That's what awaits the Christian, whether they're poor or middle class, whatever, or rich. Their spiritual rich is what awaits them as they, we are all co-heirs with Christ. Have you considered that? You are a son or a daughter of God and you are a co-heir of the firstborn, indeed, son of God, Jesus Christ himself. And what does Jesus Christ inherit? He inherits it all. Remember that? Every tongue shall confess, every knee shall bow. That Jesus Christ is Lord over all. The promise is for all the poor believers, you know what? Endure, rejoice in your exalted status. That one day you will be co-heirs with Christ and you will inherit the kingdom. You will be glorified together with him. Is that something you're looking forward to? Amen. We've only got a little ways to go. We only got a little ways, a little time longer on this earth before we inherit the kingdom, and we are glorified with our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Hey, is that something that the poor can rejoice in? The poor can focus on and forget about their poverty. Forget about the world. Think about what is to come. So the next time you go to Walmart, you go to Kroger, and you're walking out like I do sometimes, thinking, oh, the rich are getting richer and the poor is getting more. <laughs> you just think about what awaits you. Think about what awaits you. You know what? That'll cheer you up if you get the poor boy blues. Didn't Shad Atkins sing a song about that? <laughs> Jason, you're supposed to know the answer to that. You're a music lady. Chet Atkins, I know he did. He sang a song, The Poor Boy Blues. And we sing that song a lot, don't we? He did, yes. Thank you. I got these poor boy blues. Next time you get the poor boy or poor girl blues, remember what awaits you. Remember what is waiting for you. You are a co heir of Jesus Christ. You're going to be glorified together. How long was Jason talking about this morning? Blessed assurance? Forever. Not for 500 years, not for a thousand, but forever, all eternity. You're going to be glorified together with Christ. Mm. Let the poor rejoice in their exalted status. Let them rejoice. Let them be thankful. But watch this. You've got to resist the temptation. What's the temptation if you're poor? To be rich. Right? That's the temptation. Temptation is to not be content with what you got, but to covet. Isn't that the Tenth Commandment? Thou shalt not covet. Thou shalt not covet. But the poor are always tempted to always covet and always not be content and always want to be rich. Hey, you know it's a sin to desire to be rich. Thankfully, it's not to be rich. But it's a sin. It's not God's will. It goes against God's plan to desire to be rich. I'll prove it to you. Keep your place in James. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. No, I'm not making this up. It is indeed in Scripture. And it applies to us in a very, very practical way. And I might step on a few toes this morning, but that's okay. Because it's not me who's stepping on it. It is the Word of God. It is the Holy Spirit. 1 Timothy chapter 6, because I want to apply this to our lives in a very practical way. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6. 1 Timothy 6, verse 6. Look what the Bible says. 
Now, godliness with contentment is great gain. Should we be content with what God has given us? Yes. Church, should we be content with what God has given us? Yes. Amen. Yes. Godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, <laughs> and it's certain we can carry nothing out. Amen. I've done a lot of funerals, but I'll say this again. I'll say it again. I've never seen a U-Haul following a hearse. <laughs> never seen it in my life. When that hearse goes off in a graveside service, you know what? That casket is going to go into the ground, and there ain't nothing nobody's going to take with it. We didn't bring anything into this world. We're not, it is certain we're not going to carry anything out. Where am I? Verse 8. And having food and clothing with these, we shall be content. You content with food and clothing? Oh, that hurts all. Well, that hurts me. That hurts me. Hey, we got plenty of food. We got plenty of clothing. We should be content. But oftentimes we're not. Now look at verse 9. But those who desire to be rich. See that? Those who desire to be rich. Fall into temptation. And a snare. And in the many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. For which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrow. Don't desire to be rich. It's not God's will. You say, Pastor, you want to apply this to a practical area of life? Why do you think we shouldn't gamble? I was always told when I was a kid, don't gamble. But I was also told, you know, don't smoke, drink, or chew, or go with girls that do either. But nobody ever told me why. You know, it's like, <laughs> why can't I gamble? Well, uh, you just don't. You just don't gamble. Okay. So, I, you know, I, I took that. Okay, God doesn't like gambling, but nobody ever told me why. Why are talking about? You know, what about the lottery? I don't know if you play lottery or not. I don't know. I have no idea. But if you do, you need to stop. I'll give you a logical reason. Because if you're playing for that big, uh, I don't know what Virginia jack jackpot is now, it's up in the millions of dollars. You know, if you're playing for that, logically, statistically, you stand a whole lot better chance to stand out in the parking lot here all afternoon. Matter of fact, stand out there till midnight. Matter of fact, stand out there for a week and hope that you get struck by lightning. You stand a whole lot better chance to get struck by lightning out in the parking lot than you do of winning a jackpot. It goes against logic. Not to mention, even if you do win it, you know what that means? A multitude, multitudes of people have lost. What about them? Have you ever thought about that? What about the people with true gambling problems that have taken their children's money that their children needed to buy shoes or food or clothing and spent it on lottery tickets? They lost. She won. Oh, but it's legal, Pastor. Oh, yeah, the states love it. You bet they do. Because who in the world takes, I'll take a weekly amount. No, everybody takes what? I want it all right now. And the state gets half of it back in taxes. They get half of it back. It works out real good for them. They love the lottery. But you know what? Logically, why would anybody play the lottery? To get rich. Right? I mean, now y'all correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, don't correct me now. But you know, if you think I'm wrong, <laughs> after I eat my chicken, <laughs> and I get full, you know, and I'm content, then you say, Pastor, I, I play the lottery just for, I don't know, I just like to pick the numbers. But I, I think really truly, people are, you play the lottery because you want to get rich. Hey, you, you, I don't play the big jackpot lottery. I just do little scratch-offs. Okay. You just, don't you want to be richer? That's what broke me from playing lottery. Actually, you ever played the lottery? Yep. I was 17 years old. Me and a buddy mowed the yard. We split the profits. $30 to push mow yard for about two hours. But we split the profits. $15 a piece. One day, he got the bright idea when I was 17. Hey, let's pool our money. My dad buys lottery tickets, and sometimes he'll win 50 bucks. Sometimes he'll win 100 bucks. If we buy $30 worth of lottery tickets, surely, surely we'll win at least 50. I said, all right, let's go and try it. I was 17 years old. A little convenience store in Princeton, West Virginia. Didn't care. So I went in there, you know, and I bought $30 worth of lottery tickets. Oh, we scratched them off in the truck. Oh, boy, we were We won. 
$17. I never played in the water after that. But why, why did we do that? Because we wanted to be richer. And we wanted the easy way. Right? We didn't want to mow the yard. That's hard work. Hey, if we can get 50 bucks by scratching off a ticket, that's a lot easier. It was a desire to be rich. Don't gamble. And if you're rich, is it a sin? Oh, thankfully not. Look, please, if you will, in 1 Timothy chapter 6. Go on down to verse 17. Thank God it's not a sin. And, and you know, you're not excluded from the kingdom of God if you're rich. Look at verse 17 of 1 Timothy chapter 6. Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but trust in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good, that they may be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, and storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. Ah, that's the commandments of those of us, all of us who are wealthy. Don't trust in riches. Don't trust in them. Trust in God. Hey, don't cling to them. Don't cling to them. Share. Be willing to share. Be generous. And store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Remember what Jesus said about those treasures in heaven? Hey, can moth, can moss corrupt them? Do they rust? Do thieves break in and steal them? Do you, you, do you lose it all on a Bitcoin scam by Sam Watts' face? No, they're secure in heaven. That's what 1 Timothy's talking about. Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. And what Jesus said, for where your treasure is, where your treasure is, there's your heart. There's your heart. Oh, and what James says, that they may lay hold on eternal life. Goes right back to James. So let's get back to James. And look at the second point here. The rich believer, feel this in, must rejoice in their humbled status. But the rich believer must rejoice in their humble status. Because the, the lowly brother or the poor brother glory in his exaltation. And I know it's hard to see here it is in the English, but in the Greek it's more evident. And also the rich brother in his humiliation. In other words, if you're wealthy, rejoice that God will humble you. Rejoice. Be glad that God is not going to let you worship and trust in riches, he's going to humble you. So what does this look like? All right, you ready to be humiliated? I didn't get the eight minutes. I'm sorry. <laughs> does this sound better? You ready to be humble? Yes. Humiliation number one, life is brief. Life is brief. This life in this world passes away like a vapor. It's, it, it, it's like a vapor. It disappears quickly. James describes it as like, you're like a beautiful, a rich person is like a beautiful flower. It, it's beautiful appearance, but it perishes so quickly. Hey, also, people who pursue wealth, they fade away. They just kind of fade away in their pursuits. Life is brief. I don't have time to go to Psalm 49. Oh, but I'm tempted to. But y'all make a big asterisk by Psalm 49, and I hope, I hope, and I hope, and I pray you read it when you get home. Read Psalm 49. Oh, it is so powerful and so practical about wealth and about the brevity of life and about the brevity of wealth. But humiliation number one, life is brief. Hey, I'm 48 years old and I don't understand why people call it middle age. <laughs> it ain't middle age. I'm two-thirds of the way over that hill. Because she and I were talking about we're going on our 30th anniversary. We started dating on May 19th. <laughs> May 19th, 1993. Guys, it's good to also remember your anniversary of your date, too. Uh -huh. Don't put the pressure on anybody. May 19th. That's 30 years ago this year. I was 18. Oh, boy, was I something. 18. You know why I was something? One reason I weighed 50 pounds less. I weigh 50 pounds less. You know, no wonder my 18-year-old self had so much energy. He wasn't carrying around an extra 50 pounds like I am. You know, 18 years old. Now I'm 48. But in another 30 years, we're about how old are we? 70. 70. Why do they call it mid middle age? I'm not in the middle. I'm two-thirds of the way towards the end. And I may not live to be 78. I may not live to be 49. 
Life is so brief. It's a vapor. It's a vapor that appears for a little while. Then it vanishes away. Hey, don't store up for yourselves treasures on this earth because you ain't going to be able to time to enjoy them. And you don't know who else is going to get them. If you give them to your kids or your grandkids, it might ruin their life. There's a good chance it will. You don't want to leave them a whole lot because then they'll become entitled and become lazy and they'll get all messed up. Marie Osmond, I think. Marie Osmond said, I'm not going to leave my kids anything. Because if I leave a fortune, it's just going to ruin their life. Life is brief. Humiliation number two. Wealth cannot bring you love, contentment, or joy. Wealth may be able to get you a husband, may be able to get you a wife, but ain't going to buy you love. Didn't the Beatles sing a song about that? I don't care too much for money. Money can't buy me love. All right? There's a the truth to that. Money can't buy me love. You know, I, I see some, some wives of some billionaires, I'm not going to mention any names, and I think, huh, I wonder if that woman married that guy for his dashing good looks. <laughs> I don't think so. My opinion, I just don't see how. No. Money can get your husband or get your wife, but it can't buy love. It certainly can't get you joy. And it certainly cannot get you contentment. Amen. You know what? Oftentimes it's the very exact opposite. The more money you got, the more discontented you are. Because what? The more we want in our flesh, the more we want. I mean, I'm sorry. The more we have, the more we want. The more we got, the more we want. Not to mention that the rich person is always discontented because they're worried about what they got. They're worried about losing what they got. And they stay up late at night and they strategize and they plan and they worry about how they're going to hold on to what they got and how they're going to get more. And it's the opposite of contentment. It's the opposite of contentment. So money and wealth can't buy you love, contentment, or joy. And humiliation number three, wealth cannot solve all your problems. They might be able to solve some, but not all. And if you're trusting your wealth, you know what? I'll tell you this. If you're a child of God, and God knows in your heart you start trusting your wealth, He will bring a trial into your life. He'll bring a tribulation into your life that your wealth cannot fix. Because no matter how rich a person is, you know what? They cannot buy one more second of life. They can't buy one more moment, one second of life. I've been a pastor for almost 15 years. I don't know how many times someone has told me, Pastor, I will give up everything I have if I could eradicate the cancer from my beloved wife's body. If I could fix my husband's heart, I will give every penny that I have. You start trusting your wealth, God will bring a trial into your life that money ain't going to fix. And you got to do what? You got to turn to Him. You got to trust Him. Because money will not fix all of your problems. Matter of fact, money won't fix most of your problems. It's just not going to happen. So, let the wealthy what? The temptation is to trust and take security and love our wealth. That's the temptation. Just like the temptation for the poor is to be rich, the temptation for the rich is to, hey, I want to trust and I want to worship my wealth and my material possessions. Hey, we all got wealth in this room. And you say, oh, okay. you got wealth. You got wealth. I want to ask you something. Do you own your wealth or does your wealth own you? Do you own your wealth? Or does your wealth own you? So, let's humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. And if you're poor, poverty doesn't, doesn't define you. If you're rich, your wealth doesn't define you. Let the poor forget about their poverty and let the rich forget about their wealth and let's all focus on obtaining the crown of life. Right? Number three, all believers, rich or poor, middle class, must endure temptations to receive the crown of life. It's an expression that refers to eternal life to come where believers will reign together with Christ and his kingdom. But you know what? Every child of God, every child of God, rich, poor, middle class, old, young, whatever, will be tested and proved before they receive the crown of life. 
Did y'all hear that? Every child of God will be tested and will be proved before they receive the crown of life. Look at verse 12. Blessed is a man who endures temptation. For when he has, when he has been improved, approved, he will receive the crown of life. You've got to endure the trials of life mentioned in verses 2 through 8. You also have to endure the various temptations that come with the trials, the temptations of worldly wealth. As we navigate and as we live this life, you have to endure them and you have to have a faith that is proven, that's been tested and proved like a precious metal. And then you're going to what? You will receive the crown of life. And the Lord has promised this crown of life to who? To those who love him. To those who love him. You know, my prayer, remember at the beginning of the sermon, we love you, Lord. I think if I'll ask you all, hey, do you love the Lord? You all would say what? Yeah. Yeah, I love the Lord. God's going to test that. Because if we love the Lord, we have faith. We believe that God is who He is, who He said He is. We believe that God is who He is. That the Lord Jesus Christ has done and accomplished all that the Word tells us He has. He's died for our sins. He's risen again from the dead. He's ascended to the right hand of the Father. And He's coming back as Lord of Lords and King of Kings. We believe. We have faith. But if it's true faith, it's going to be tested. And it's going to be approved. And then we can know we will receive the crown of life. Was Jesus Christ tested? Yes. He was tested. Hey, he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Remember that in Matthew chapter 4, I believe? 40 days and 40 nights in the desert. He was tested. He was tempted by Satan. And you don't have to turn here, but I just want to read this passage from you in Hebrews chapter 4. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 8, that though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. Though he was a son, he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And Hebrews 4, 8, and having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Jesus Christ was tempted and tried in the desert by Satan and also on the cross. Did he triumph? Was he approved? Where is he seated at now? Right now. What's he encouraging us? He's encouraging us. The author and the finisher of our faith. Keep running the race. Endure the trials. Learn from them. Become more like me. Don't let worldly wealth and the things of this world sideline you and get you off track. Keep striving for and running the race to obtain the crown of life. Because, oh, our worst temptations and trials and valleys, things we go through, are not even worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us through Christ. Christian, endure the temptation of worldly wealth and endure the trials of life, knowing what's awaiting on you, knowing what's ahead of you, knowing what can never be, ever, ever be taken away from you. Eternal life in Christ Jesus. Look to Him, the author and the finisher of your faith, who for the joy set before Him endured the cross, despised the shame, and is now seated at the right hand of God the Father. And Lord Jesus, we give you glory, we give you thanksgiving this morning, that you have ran the race before us. You blazed the trail. You were tempted. You were tried. But you overcame all the trials and all the temptations. And you overcame death and the grave. Death and the grave. On the cross and through your glorious resurrection. 
And now you are speaking to us. Holy Spirit, you are speaking to us. Hey, don't get distracted by worldly wealth. Don't get distracted by the things of this world. The things of this world are passing away. They're passing away. But he or she who does the will of God will abide forever. Christian, are you discontented about anything in your life? Are you bitter about anything? Are you frustrated or angry at God about your lot in life? God knows. God knows. And He's spoken to you through His Word. Will you repent? Will you change? And will you turn back and say, Lord, test my faith Try me. Remove any impurities in my life. And I pray, Lord, I would walk through this and be approved, knowing the crown of life awaits me. Hey, if you've got a genuine faith, it will be tested. Do you want a genuine faith? Do you have a genuine faith? I pray you do. It's got to be tested. It will be tested. Would you submit to that? Would you be content and rejoice? Rejoice? Be joyful where you are? Or are you going to be bitter and angry? here who has never trusted in Christ, they don't know him as Savior and Lord. <clears throat> Would you believe that Jesus died for your sins? Would you believe that he rose again from the dead? Would you believe that he's coming back again as Lord of Lords and King of Kings? Would you repent of your sins and turn away from him and turn to faith in him? Would you surrender your life to him, poverty or riches or middle of the road, it doesn't matter. Would you have faith and believe that he died for your sins and that he lives evermore? Would you believe and become a child of God, a son or daughter of God and a co-heir of Christ? He offers it to you. He won't turn your way if you come in faith. He won't turn your way. Oh, God, as we're about ready to sing, just as I am, I believe, my memory serves me correctly, the song, Lord, I pray we would come, just as we are. In our brokenness or our bitterness or our anger or whatever, and lay it down, lay it down at your throne of grace and receive the promises of the kingdom. I pray your people would come. If you call them and if they would obey, they would come. Hear this invitation. May your will be done on this earth and in our lives and in this church just as it is in heaven. And I pray these things in Christ Jesus' holy name. Amen. Please stand.